On the Migration of Fables By F. Max Muller On the Migration of Fables A lecture delivered at the Royal Institution, on Friday, June 3, 1870 From Chips from a German Workshop, by F. Max Muller, Volume 4, pages 139-198 to New York, Charles Scribner's Sons, 1881 Count not your chickens before they be hatched is a well-known proverb in English, and most people, if asked what was its origin, would probably appeal to La Fontaine's delightful fable, La Laetiere et le pot au la. One we all know parrot, lightly stepping along from her village to the town, carrying the milk pail on her head, and in her daydream selling her milk for a good sum, then buying a hundred eggs, then selling the chickens, then buying a pig. Fattening it, selling it again, and buying a cow with a calf. The calf frolics about, and kicks up his legs, so does Parrot, and, alas. The pail falls down, the milk is spilt, her rich is gone, and she only hopes when she comes home that she may escape a flogging from her husband. Did La Fontaine invent this fable? Or did he merely follow the example of Socrates, who, as we know from the Phaedon, too occupied himself in prison, during the last days of his life, with turning into verse some of the fables, or, as he calls them, the myths of Aesop. La Fontaine published the first six books of his fables in 1668-3 and it is well known that the subjects of most of these early fables were taken from Aesop, Phaedrus, Horace, and other classical fabulists, if we may adopt this word, fabulist. Which La Fontaine was the first to introduce into French. In 1678 a second edition of these six books was published, enriched by five books of new fables, and in 1694 a new edition appeared, containing one additional book, thus completing the collection of his charming poems. The Fable of Parrot stands in the seventh book, and was published, therefore, for the first time in the edition of 1678. In the preface to that edition La Fontaine says, it is not necessary that I should say whence I have taken the subjects of these new fables. I shall only say, from a sense of gratitude, the largest portion of them to Pilpe the Indian sage. If, then, La Fontaine tells us himself that he borrowed the subjects of most of his new fables from Pilpe, the Indian sage, we have clearly a right to look to India in order to see whether, in the ancient literature of that country, any traces can be discovered of parrot with the milk pail. Sanskrit literature is very rich in fables and stories, no other literature can vie with it in that respect, nay, it is extremely likely that fables, in particular animal fables, had their principal source in India. In the sacred literature of the Buddhists, fables held a most prominent place. The Buddhist preachers, addressing themselves chiefly to the people, to the untaught, the uncared for, the outcast, spoke to them, as we still speak to children, in fables, in proverbs and parables. Many of these fables and parables must have existed before the rise of the Buddhist religion. Others, no doubt, were added on the spur of the moment, just as Socrates would invent a myth or fable whenever that form of argument seemed to him most likely to impress and convince his hearers. But Buddhism gave a new and permanent sanction to this whole branch of moral mythology, and in the sacred canon, as it was settled in the third century before Christ, many a fable received, and holds to the present day, its recognized place. After the fall of Buddhism in India, and even during its decline, the Brahmins claimed the inheritance of their enemies, and used their popular fables for educational purposes. The best known of these collections of fables in Sanskrit is the Pankatantra, literally the Pentateuch, or Pentameron. From it and from other sources another collection was made, well known to all Sanskrit scholars by the name of Hydopadisa, i.e. Salutary Advice. Both these books have been published in England and Germany, and there are translations of them in English, German, French, and other languages. 4. The first question which we have to answer refers to the date of these collections, and dates in the history of Sanskrit literature are always difficult points. Fortunately, as we shall see, we can in this case fix the date of the Pankatantra at least, by means of a translation into ancient Persian, which was made about 550 years after Christ. Though even then we can only prove that a collection somewhat like the Pankatantra must have existed at that time. 
but we cannot refer the book, in exactly that form in which we now possess it, to that distant period. If we look for La Fontaine's fable in the Sanskrit stories of the Pankatantra, we do not find, indeed, the milkmaid counting her chickens before they are hatched, but we meet with the following story. There lived in a certain place a Brahmin, whose name was Svabhavakrapana, which means a born miser. He had collected a quantity of rice by begging, this reminds us somewhat of the Buddhist mendicants, and after having dined off it, he filled a pot with what was left over. He hung the pot on a peg on the wall, placed his couch beneath, and looking intently at it all the night, he thought, ah, that pot is indeed brimful of rice. Now, if there should be a famine, I should certainly make a hundred rupees by it. With this I shall buy a couple of goats. They will have young ones every six months, and thus I shall have a whole herd of goats. Then, with the goats, I shall buy cows. As soon as they have calved, I shall sell the calves. Then, with the cows, I shall buy buffaloes, with the buffaloes, mares. When the mares have foaled, I shall have plenty of horses, and when I sell them, plenty of gold. With that gold I shall get a house with four wings. And then a Brahmin will come to my house, and will give me his beautiful daughter, with a large dowry. She will have a son, and I shall call him Somasarman. When he is old enough to be danced on his father's knee, I shall sit with a book at the back of the stable, and while I am reading the boy will see me, jump from his mother's lap, and run towards me to be danced on my knee. He will come too near the horse's hoof, and, full of anger, I shall call to my wife, take the baby, take him. But she, distracted by some domestic work does not hear me. Then I get up, and give her such a kick with my foot. While he thought this, he gave a kick with his foot, and broke the pot. All the rice fell over him, and made him quite white. Therefore, I say, he who makes foolish plans for the future will be white all over, like the father of Somasarman. 5. I shall at once proceed to read you the same story, though slightly modified, from the Hytopadisa.6 The Hytopadisa professes to be taken from the Pankatantra and some other books. And in this case it would seem as if some other authority had been followed. You will see, at all events, how much freedom there was in telling the old story of the man who built castles in the air. In the town of Devakata there lived a Brahmin of the name of Devasarman. At the feast of the great equinox he received a plate full of rice. He took it, went into a potter's shop, which was full of crockery, and, overcome by the heat, he lay down in a corner and began to doze. In order to protect his plate of rice, he kept a stick in his hand, and began to think, now, if I sell this plate of rice, I shall receive ten cowries, kapradaka. I shall then, on the spot, buy pots and plates, and after having increased my capital again and again, I shall buy and sell beetle nuts and dresses till I become enormously rich. Then I shall marry four wives, and the youngest and prettiest of the four I shall make a great pet of. Then the other wives will be so angry, and begin to quarrel. But I shall be in a great rage, and take a stick, and give them a good flogging. While he said this, he flung his stick away, the plate of rice was smashed to pieces, and many of the pots in the shop were broken. The potter, hearing the noise, ran into the shop, and when he saw his pots broken, he gave the Brahmin a good scolding, and drove him out of his shop. Therefore I say, he who rejoices over plans for the future will come to grief, like the Brahmin who broke the pots. In spite of the change of a Brahmin into a milkmaid, no one, I suppose, will doubt that we have here in the stories of the Pankatantra and Hydopadisa the first germs of La Fontaine's fable. 7. But how did that fable travel all the way from India to France? How did it doff its Sanskrit garment and don the light dress of modern French? How was the stupid Brahmin born again as the brisk milkmaid, Cotillon simple Edisulier's plats? It seems a startling case of longevity that while languages have changed, while works of art have perished, while empires have risen and vanished again, this simple children's story should have lived on. And maintained its place of honor and its undisputed sway in every schoolroom of the East and every nursery of the West. And yet it is a case of longevity so well attested that even the most skeptical would hardly venture to question it.
We have the passport of these stories vised at every place through which they have passed, and, as far as I can judge, parfaitment and regla. The story of the migration of these Indian fables from east to west is indeed wonderful. More wonderful and more instructive than many of these fables themselves. Will it be believed that we, in this Christian country and in the nineteenth century, teach our children the first, the most important lessons of worldly wisdom, nay, of a more than worldly wisdom, from books borrowed from Buddhists and Brahmins? From heretics and idolaters, and that wise words, spoken a thousand, nay, two thousand years ago, in a lonely village of India, like precious seeds scattered broadcast all over the world. Still bear fruit a hundred and a thousandfold in that soil which is the most precious before God and man, the soul of a child. No lawgiver, no philosopher, has made his influence felt so widely, so deeply, and so permanently as the author of these children's fables. But who was he? We do not know. His name, like the name of many a benefactor of the human race, is forgotten. We only know he was an Indian, and that he lived at least two thousand years ago. No doubt, when we first hear of the Indian origin of these fables, and of their migration from India to Europe, we wonder whether it can be so. But the fact is, that the story of this Indo-European migration is not, like the migration of the Indo-European languages, myths, and legends, a matter of theory, but of history. And that it was never quite forgotten either in the East or in the West. Each translator, as he handed on his treasure, seems to have been anxious to show how he came by it. Several writers who have treated of the origin and spreading of Indo-European stories and fables, have mixed up two or three questions which ought to be treated each on its own merits. The first question is whether the Aryans, when they broke up their pro-ethnic community, carried away with them, not only their common grammar and dictionary, but likewise some myths and legends which we find that Indians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, Celts, Germans, slaves, when they emerge into the light of history, share in common. That certain deities occur in India, Greece, and Germany, having the same names and the same character, is a fact that can no longer be denied. That certain heroes, too, known to Indians, Greeks, and Romans, point to one and the same origin, both by their name and by their history, is a fact by this time admitted by all whose admission is of real value. As heroes are in most cases gods in disguise, there is nothing very startling in the fact that nations, who had worshipped the same gods, should also have preserved some common legends of demigods or heroes, nay, even in a later phase of thought. Of fairies and ghosts. The case, however, becomes much more problematical when we ask, whether stories also, fables told with a decided moral purpose, formed part of that earliest Aryan inheritance. This is still doubted by many who have no doubts whatever as to common Aryan myths and legends, and even those who, like myself, have tried to establish by tentative arguments the existence of common Aryan fables. Dating from before the Aryan separation, have done so only by showing a possible connection between ancient popular saws and mythological ideas, capable of a moral application. To any one, for instance, who knows how in the poetical mythology of the Aryan tribes, the golden splendor of the rising sun leads to conceptions of the wealth of the dawn in gold and jewels and her readiness to shower them upon her worshippers. The modern German proverb, Morgenstund hat gold im Mund, seems to have a kind of mythological ring, and the stories of benign fairies, changing everything into gold. Sound likewise like an echo from the long-forgotten forest of our common Aryan home. If we know how the trick of dragging stolen cattle backwards into their place of hiding, so that their footprints might not lead to the discovery of the thief, appears again and again in the mythology of different Aryan nations. Then the pointing of the same trick as a kind of proverb, intended to convey a moral lesson, and illustrated by fables of the same or a very similar character in India and Greece makes one feel inclined to suspect that here too the roots of these fables may reach to a pro-ethnic period. Vestigia nulla retrorsum is clearly an ancient proverb, dating from a nomadic period, and when we see how Plato, Alcibiades, I. 123, was perfectly familiar with the Aesopian myth or fable, Kappa Alpha Tau Tau Nu Alpha Sigma Pi Omicron Upsilon Mu Theta Omicron Nu, he says, of the fox declining to enter the lion's cave, 
because all footsteps went into it and none came out, and how the Sanskrit Pankatantra, 3. 14, tells of a jackal hesitating to enter his own cave, because he sees the footsteps of a lion going in, but not coming out, we feel strongly inclined to admit a common origin for both fables. Here, however, the idea that the Greeks, like La Fontaine, had borrowed their fable from the Pankatantra would be simply absurd, and it would be much more rational, if the process must be one of borrowing, to admit, as Ben Fay, Panskatantra, I. 381, does, that the Hindus, after Alexander's discovery of India, borrowed this story from the Greeks. But if we consider that each of the two fables has its own peculiar tendency, the one deriving its lesson from the absence of backward footprints of the victims, the other from the absence of backward footprints of the lion himself. The admission of a common Aryan proverb such as, vestigia nulla retrorsum, would far better explain the facts such as we find them. I am not ignorant of the difficulties of this explanation, and I would myself point to the fact that among the Hottentots, too, Dr. Bleak has found a fable of the jackal declining to visit the sick lion, because the traces of the animals who went to see him did not turn back. 8. Without, however, pronouncing any decided opinion on this vexed question, what I wish to place clearly before you is this, that the spreading of Aryan myths, legends, and fables, dating from a pro-ethnic period, has nothing whatever to do with the spreading of fables taking place in strictly historical times from India to Arabia, to Greece and the rest of Europe, not by means of oral tradition, but through more or less faithful translations of literary works. Those who like may doubt whether Zeus was Djausch, whether Daphne was Ahna, whether La Belle Bois was the mother of two children, called Loror and Le Jour 9 but the fact that a collection of fables was, in the 6th century of our era, brought from India to Persia, and by means of various translations naturalized among Persians, Arabs, Greeks, Jews, and all the rest, admits of no doubt or cavil. Several thousand years have passed between those two migrations, and to mix them up together, to suppose that comparative mythology has anything to do with the migration of such fables as that of Parrot, would be an anachronism of a portentous character. There is a third question, viz., whether besides the two channels just mentioned, there were others through which Eastern fables could have reached Europe, or Aesopian and other European fables have been transferred to the East. There are such channels, no doubt. Persian and Arab stories, of Indian origin, were through the Crusaders brought back to Constantinople, Italy, and France. Buddhist fables were through Mongolian Ten Conquerors, 13th century, carried to Russia and the eastern parts of Europe. Greek stories may have reached Persia and India at the time of Alexander's conquests and during the reigns of the Diadochi, and even Christian legends may have found their way to the East through missionaries, travelers, or slaves. Lastly, there comes the question, how far our common human nature is sufficient to account for coincidences in beliefs, customs, proverbs, and fables, which, at first sight, seem to require an historical explanation. I shall mention but one instance. Professor Wilson, Essays on Sanskrit Literature, I, page 201, pointed out that the story of the Trojan horse occurs in a Hindu tale, only that instead of the horse we have an elephant. But he rightly remarked that the coincidence was accidental. In the one case, after a siege of nine years, the principal heroes of the Greek army are concealed in a wooden horse, dragged into Troy by a stratagem, and the story ends by their falling upon the Trojans and conquering the city of Priam. In the other story a king bent on securing a son-in-law, had an elephant constructed by able artists, and filled with armed men. The elephant was placed in a forest, and when the young prince came to hunt, the armed men sprang out, overpowered the prince and brought him to the king, whose daughter he was to marry. However striking the similarity may seem to one unaccustomed to deal with ancient legends, I doubt whether any comparative mythologist has postulated a common Aryan origin for these two stories. They feel that, as far as the mere construction of a wooden animal is concerned, all that was necessary to explain the origin of the idea in one place was present also in the other. And that while the Trojan horse forms an essential part of a mythological cycle, there is nothing truly mythological or legendary in the Indian story. The idea of a hunter disguising himself in the skin of an animal, 
or even of one animal assuming the disguise of another eleven are familiar in every part of the world, and if that is so. Then the step from hiding under the skin of a large animal to that of hiding in a wooden animal is not very great. Every one of these questions, as I said before, must be treated on its own merits, and while the traces of the first migration of Aryan fables can be rediscovered only by the most minute and complex inductive processes. The documents of the latter are to be found in the library of every intelligent collector of books. Thus, to return to Parrot and the fables of Pilpe, Hute, the learned bishop of Avranche, the friend of La Fontaine, had only to examine the prefaces of the principal translations of the Indian fables in order to track their wanderings. As he did in his famous, Traite de l'Origine de Romans, published at Paris in 1670, two years after the appearance of the first collection of La Fontaine's fables. Since his time the evidence has become more plentiful, and the whole subject has been more fully and more profoundly treated by Sylvester de Sacy, 12 Oiseleur de Longchamps, 13 and Professor Benfey. 14 But though we have a more accurate knowledge of the stations by which the Eastern fables reached their last home in the West. Bishop Hute knew as well as we do that they came originally from India through Persia by way of Baghdad and Constantinople. In order to gain a commanding view of the countries traversed by these fables, let us take our position at Baghdad in the middle of the 8th century. And watch from that central point the movements of our literary caravan in its progress from the Far East to the Far West. In the middle of the 8th century, during the reign of the great Caliph al-Mansur, Abdullah ibn al makafa wrote his famous collection of fables, the Khalila and Dimna, which we still possess. The Arabic text of these fables has been published by Sylvester de Sacy, and there is an English translation of it by Mr. Nachbul, formerly professor of Arabic at Oxford. Abdullah ibn al makafa was a Persian by birth, who after the fall of the Omeyyads became a convert to Mohammedanism, and rose to high office at the court of the caliphs. Being in possession of important secrets of state, he became dangerous in the eyes of the caliph al-Mansur, and was foully murdered. 15 In the preface, Abdullah ibn al makafa tells us that he translated these fables from Pahlavi, the ancient language of Persia. And that they had been translated into Pahlavi, about 200 years before his time, by Barzwiye, the physician of Khosra Nusher Van, the king of Persia, the contemporary of the Emperor Justinian. The king of Persia had heard that there existed in India a book full of wisdom, and he had commanded his vizier, Buzurjmir, to find a man acquainted with the languages both of Persia and India. The man chosen was Barzwiye. He travelled to India, got possession of the book, translated it into Persian, and brought it back to the court of Khosru. Declining all rewards beyond a dress of honour, he only stipulated that an account of his own life and opinions should be added to the book. This account, probably written by himself, is extremely curious. It is a kind of religio medici of the 6th century, and shows us a soul dissatisfied with traditions and formularies, striving after truth, and finding rest only where many other seekers after truth have found rest before and after him. In a life devoted to alleviating the sufferings of mankind. There is another account of the journey of this Persian physician to India. It has the sanction of Ferdusi, in the great Persian epic, the Shah Naimi, and it is considered by some sixteen as more original than the one just quoted. According to it, the Persian physician read in a book that there existed in India trees or herbs supplying a medicine with which the dead could be restored to life. At the command of the king he went to India in search of those trees and herbs. But, after spending a year in vain researches, he consulted some wise people on the subject. They told him that the medicine of which he had read as having the power of restoring men to life had to be understood in a higher and more spiritual sense, and that what was really meant by it were ancient books of wisdom preserved in India, which imparted life to those who were dead in their folly and sins. 17 Thereupon the physician translated these books, and one of them was the collection of fables, the Kalila and Dimna. It is possible that both these stories were later inventions. The preface also by Ali, the son of al Farisi, in which the names of Bidpai and King Dabshalim are mentioned for the first time, is of later date. But the fact remains that Abdullah ibn al makafa 
the author of the oldest Arabic collection of our fables, translated them from Pahlavi, the language of Persia at the time of Khosra Nushirvan. And that the Pahlavi text which he translated was believed to be a translation of a book brought from India in the middle of the 6th century. That Indian book could not have been the Pankatantra, as we now possess it, but must have been a much larger collection of fables, for the Arabic translation, the Kalila and Dimna. Contains eighteen chapters instead of the five of the Pankatantra, and it is only in the fifth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth chapters that we find the same stories which form the five books of the Pankatantra in the Textus Ornatur. Even in these chapters, the Arabic translator omits stories which we find in the Sanskrit text and adds others which are not to be found there. In this Arabic translation, the story of the Brahman and the pot of rice runs as follows. A religious man was in the habit of receiving every day from the house of a merchant a certain quantity of butter, oil, and honey, of which, having eaten as much as he wanted, he put the rest into a jar, which he hung on a nail in a corner of the room, hoping that the jar would in time be filled. Now, as he was leaning back one day on his couch, with a stick in his hand, and the jar suspended over his head, he thought of the high price of butter and honey, and said to himself, I will sell what is in the jar and buy with the money which I obtain for it ten goats, which, producing each of them a young one every five months, in addition to the produce of the kids as soon as they begin to bear, it will not be long before there is a large flock. He continued to make his calculations, and found that he should at this rate, in the course of two years, have more than four hundred goats. At the expiration of this term I will buy, said he, a hundred black cattle, in the proportion of a bull or a cow for every four goats. I will then purchase land, and hire workmen to plough it with the beasts, and put it into tillage, so that before five years are over I shall, no doubt, have realized a great fortune by the sale of the milk which the cows will give, and of the produce of my land. My next business will be to build a magnificent house, and engage a number of servants, both male and female. And, when my establishment is completed, I will marry the handsomest woman I can find, who, in clue time becoming a mother, will present me with an heir to my possessions, who, as he advances in age, shall receive the best masters that can be procured. And, if the progress which he makes in learning is equal to my reasonable expectations, I shall be amply repaid for the pains and expense which I have bestowed upon him. But if, on the other hand, he disappoints my hopes, the rod which I have here shall be the instrument with which I will make him feel the displeasure of a justly offended parent. 18 At these words he suddenly raised the band which held the stick towards the jar, and broke it, and the contents ran down upon his head and face. 19 You will have observed the coincidences between the Arabic and the Sanskrit versions, but also a considerable divergence, particularly in the winding up of the story. The Brahman and the holy man both build their castles in the air. But, while the former kicks his wife, the latter only chastises his son. How this change came to pass we cannot tell. One might suppose that, at the time when the book was translated from Sanskrit into Pahlavi, or from Pahlavi into Arabic, the Sanskrit story was exactly like the Arabic story, and that it was changed afterwards. But another explanation is equally admissible, viz., that the Pahlavi or the Arabic translator wished to avoid the offensive behavior of the husband kicking his wife, and therefore substituted the son as a more deserving object of castigation. We have thus traced our story from Sanskrit to Pahlavi, and from Pahlavi to Arabic. We have followed it in its migrations from the hermitages of Indian sages to the court of the kings of Persia, and from thence to the residence of the powerful caliphs at Baghdad. Let us recollect that the Caliph al-Mansur, for whom the Arabic translation was made, was the contemporary of Abdurrahman, who ruled in Spain, and that both were but little anterior to Harun al-Rashid and Charlemagne. At that time, therefore, the way was perfectly open for these eastern fables, after they had once reached Baghdad, to penetrate into the seats of Western learning, and to spread to every part of the new empire of Charlemagne. They may have done so, for all we know, but nearly three hundred years pass before these fables meet us again in the literature of Europe. The Carlovingian Empire had fallen to pieces, Spain had been rescued from the Mohammedans, William the Conqueror had landed in England, 
and the Crusades had begun to turn the thoughts of Europe towards the East, when, about the year 1080, we hear of a Jew of the name of Simeon, the son of Seth, who translated these fables from Arabic into Greek. He states in his preface that the book came originally from India, that it was brought to the King Khosros of Persia, and then translated into Arabic. His own translation into Greek must have been made from an Arabic MS. Of the Kalila and Dimna, in some places more perfect, in others less perfect, than the one published by the Sasi. The Greek text has been published, though very imperfectly, under the title of Stephanites and Ignalates. 20 Here our fable is told as follows, page 337. It is said that a beggar kept some honey and butter in a jar close to where he slept. One night he thus thought within himself, I shall sell this honey and butter for however small a sum. With it I shall buy ten goats, and these in five months will produce as many again. In five years they will become four hundred. With them I shall buy one hundred cows, and with them I shall cultivate some land. And what with their calves and the harvests, I shall become rich in five years, and build a house with four wings, twenty-one ornamented with gold, and buy all kinds of servants, and marry a wife. She will give me a child, and I shall call him beauty it will be a boy, and I shall educate him properly. And if I see him lazy, I shall give him such a flogging with this stick. With these words he took a stick that was near him, struck the jar, and broke it, so that the honey and milk ran down on his beard. This Greek translation might, no doubt, have reached La Fontaine, but as the French poet was not a great scholar, least of all a reader of Greek MSS. And as the fables of Simeon Seth were not published till 1697, we must look for other channels through which the old fable was carried along from east to west. There is, first of all, an Italian translation of the Stephanites and Ignalates, which was published at Ferrara in 1583.22 the title is, Del Governo de Regni. Sato morali esempi di animali raginanti tra loro. Tradi prima di lingua indiana in Agarina de Lello demno Saracino. Iti poi dal Agarina nella greca de Simeoni Seto, filosofo antiochino. Iti ora tradati di greco in italiano. This translation was probably the work of Giulio Nudi. There is, besides, a Latin translation, or rather a free rendering of the Greek translation by the learned Jesuit, Petrus Pausinus, which was published at Rome in 1666. 23 This may have been, and, according to some authorities, has really been one of the sources from which La Fontaine drew his inspirations. But though La Fontaine may have consulted this work for other fables, I do not think that he took from it the fable of Parrot and the Milk Pail. The fact is, these fables had found several other channels through which, as early as the 13th century, they reached the literary market of Europe, and became familiar as household words, at least among the higher and educated classes. We shall follow the course of some of these channels. First, then, a learned Jew, whose name seems to have been Joel, translated our fables from Arabic into Hebrew, 1250. His work has been preserved in one MS at Paris, but has not yet been published, except the tenth book, which was communicated by Dr. Neubauer to Benfi's journal. Orient and Occident, Volume 1, page 658. This Hebrew translation was translated by another converted Jew, Johannes of Capua, into Latin. His translation was finished between 1263 to 1278, and, under the title of, Directorium Humani Vitae. It became very soon a popular work with the select reading public of the 13th century.24 in the Directorium, and in Joel's translation. The name of Sendabar is substituted for that of Bidpay. The Directorium was translated into German at the command of Eberhard, the great Duke of Württemberg 25 and both the Latin text and the German translation occur, in repeated editions. Among the rare books printed between 1480 and the end of the 15th century.26 a Spanish translation, founded both on the German and the Latin texts. Appeared at Burgos in 1493, 27 and from these different sources flowed in the 16th century the Italian renderings of Ferenzuola, 1548, 28 and Doni, 1552, 
Point 29 as these Italian translations were repeated in French 30 and English. Before the end of the 16th century, they might no doubt have supplied La Fontaine with subjects for his fables. But, as far as we know, it was a third channel that really brought the Indian fables to the immediate notice of the French poet. A Persian poet, of the name of Nasser Allah, translated the work of Abdullah ibn al makafa into Persian about 1150. This Persian translation was enlarged in the 15th century by another Persian poet, Hussein ben Ali called El Vais, under the title of Anvari Suheli. 31 This name will be familiar to many members of the Indian civil service, as being one of the old Halebri class books which had to be construed by all who wished to gain high honors in Persia. This work, or the second book is a translation of the second part of Doni's Philosophia Morale. At least the first books of it, were translated into French by David Sahid of Ispahan, and published at Paris in 1644, under the title of Livre de Lumières, O.U., La Conduite de Royce, Composé par le Sage Pilpe, Indian. This translation, we know, fell into the hands of La Fontaine, and a number of his most charming fables were certainly borrowed from it. But Parrot with the Milk Pail has not yet arrived at the end of her journey, for if we look at the Livre de Lumières, as published at Paris, we find neither the milkmaid nor her prototype, the Brahmin who kicks his wife, or the religious man who flogs his boy. That story occurs in the later chapters, which were left out in the French translation, and La Fontaine, therefore, must have met with his model elsewhere. Remember that in all our wanderings we have not yet found the milkmaid, but only the Brahmin or the religious man. What we want to know is who first brought about this metamorphosis. No doubt La Fontaine was quite the man to seize on any jewel which was contained in the Oriental fables, to remove the cumbersome and foreign-looking setting. And then to place the principal figure in that pretty frame in which most of us have first become acquainted with it. But in this case the charmer's wand did not belong to La Fontaine, but to some forgotten worthy, whose very name it will be difficult to fix upon with certainty. We have, as yet, traced three streams only, all starting from the Arabic translation of Abdullah ibn al makafa one in the 11th, another in the 12th, a third in the 13th century, all reaching Europe. Some touching the very steps of the throne of Louis XIV. Yet none of them carrying the leaf which contained the story of Parrot, or of the Vibrahman, to the threshold of La Fontaine's home. We must, therefore, try again. After the conquest of Spain by the Mohammedans, Arabic literature had found a new home in Western Europe, and among the numerous works translated from Arabic into Latin or Spanish. We find towards the end of the 13th century, 1289, a Spanish translation of our fables, called Kalila e Dimna. 32 In this the name of the philosopher is changed from Bidpai to Bundabel. This, or another translation from Arabic, was turned into Latin verse by Raymond de Bezies in 1313, not published. Lastly, we find in the same century another translation from Arabic straight into Latin verse, by Baldo, which became known under the name of Esopus Altar. 33. From these frequent translations, and translations of translations, in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, we see quite clearly that these Indian fables were extremely popular, and were, in fact, more widely read in Europe than the Bible, or any other book. They were not only read in translations, but having been introduced into sermons, 34 homilies, and works on morality, they were improved upon, acclimatized, localized, moralized. Till at last it is almost impossible to recognize their oriental features under their homely disguises. I shall give you one instance only. Rabelais, in his, Gargantua, gives a long description how a man might conquer the whole world. At the end of this dialogue, which was meant as a satire on Charles V, we read, There was there present at that time an old gentleman well experienced in the wars, a stern soldier, and who had been in many great hazards, named de Kefron, who, hearing this discourse, said, J. Grand Père K. Tout s'est entreprise sera assemblable à la farce du pot au late duquel un cordavenir se faisoit riche par resverie, pus le pot casse, en yuc de quoi disner. This is clearly our story, only the Brahmin has, as yet, 
been changed into a shoemaker only, and the pot of rice or the jar of butter and honey into a pitcher of milk. Now it is perfectly true that if a writer of the 15th century changed the Brahmin into a shoemaker, La Fontaine might, with the same right, have replaced the Brahmin by his milkmaid. Knowing that the story was current, was, in fact, common property in the 15th century, nay, even at a much earlier date, we might really be satisfied after having brought the germs of parrot within easy reach of La Fontaine. But, fortunately, we can make at least one step further, a step of about two centuries. This step backwards brings us to the 13th century, and there we find our old Indian friend again, and this time really changed into a milkmaid. The book I refer to is written in Latin, and is called, Dialogus Creaturarum Optimi Moralizatus, in English, The Dialogue of Creatures Moralized. It was a book intended to teach the principles of Christian morality by examples taken from ancient fables. It was evidently a most successful book, and was translated into several modern languages. There is an old translation of it in English, first printed by Rastel, 35 and afterwards repeated in 1816. I shall read you from it the fable in which, as far as I can find, the milkmaid appears for the first time on the stage, surrounded already by much of that scenery which, four hundred years later, received its last touches at the hand of La Fontaine. Dialogo C. P. Xii. For as it is but madness to trust to motion Shurit, so it is but folly to hope to Moshe vanities, for vain be all earthly things longing to men, as saith David, Saul. Zi, whereof it is told in Fablis that a lady upon a time delivered to her maiden a gallon of milk to sell at a site, and by the way, as she sate and rested her by a ditch side. She began to think that with the money of the milk she wolled by an henny, the which shulda bringe forth chickens, and when they were grown to henny she wolled a sell them and by pig geese, and as chong them into sheep, and the sheep into oxen. And so when she was come to Rikhesa she should be married right worshipfully unto some worthy man, and thus she reoiced. And when she was thus marvelously comforted and ravished inwardly in her secret solace, thinking with how great Ioe she should be led at toward the church with her husband on horseback, she said to herself, Gui, Gui. So daily she smote the ground with her foot, minding to spur the horse, but her foot slipped, and she fell in the ditch, and there lay all her milk, and so she was far away from her purpose, and never had that she hopped to have. 36. Here we have arrived at the end of our journey. It has been a long journey across fifteen or twenty centuries, and I am afraid our following parrot from country to country, and from language to language, may have tired some of my hearers. I shall, therefore, not attempt to fill the gap that divides the fable of the thirteenth century from La Fontaine. Suffice it to say, that the milkmaid, having once taken the place of the Brahmin, maintained it against all corners. We find her as Dona Truhanna, in the famous, Conde Lucaner, the work of the Infante Don Juan Manuel, 37 who died in 1347, the grandson of Saint Ferdinand, the nephew of Alfonso the Wise, though himself not a king, yet more powerful than a king. Renowned both by his sword and by his pen, and possibly not ignorant of Arabic, the language of his enemies. We find her again in the Cant et Nouvelles of Bonaventure de Puriers, published in the 16th century, a book which we know that La Fontaine was well acquainted with. We find her after La Fontaine in all the languages of Europe. 38. You see now before your eyes the bridge on which our fables came to us from east to west. The same bridge which brought us parrot brought us hundreds of fables, all originally sprung up in India many of them carefully collected by Buddhist priests, and preserved in their sacred canon. Afterwards handed on to the Brahminic writers of a later age, carried by Barzwiye from India to the court of Persia, then to the courts of the caliphs at Baghdad and Cordova, and of the emperors at Constantinople. Some of them, no doubt, perished on their journey, others were mixed up together, others were changed till we should hardly know them again. Still, if you once know the eventful journey of Parrot, you know the journey of all the other fables that belong to this Indian cycle. Few of them have gone through so many changes, few of them have found so many friends, whether in the courts of kings or in the huts of beggars. Few of them have been to places where Parrot has not also been. 
This is why I selected her and her passage through the world as the best illustration of a subject which otherwise would require a whole course of lectures to do it justice. But though our fable represents one large class or cluster of fables, it does not represent all. There were several collections, besides the Pankatantra, which found their way from India to Europe. The most important among them is the Book of the Seven Wise Masters, or the Book of Sinbad, the history of which has lately been written, with great learning and ingenuity, by Signor Comparetti. 39. These large collections of fables and stories mark what may be called the high roads on which the literary products of the East were carried to the West. But there are, beside these high roads, some smaller, less trodden paths on which single fables, sometimes mere proverbs, similes, or metaphors, have come to us from India, from Persepolis, from Damascus and Baghdad. I have already alluded to the powerful influence which Arabic literature exercised on Western Europe through Spain. Again, a most active interchange of Eastern and Western ideas took place at a later time during the progress of the Crusades. Even the inroads of Mongolian tribes into Russia and the east of Europe kept up a literary bartering between Oriental and Occidental nations. Old Collection of Indian Fables But few would have suspected a father of the church as an importer of Eastern fables. Yet so it is. At the court of the same Caliph al-Mansur, where Abdullah ibn al makafa translated the fables of Kala and Dimna from Persian into Arabic, there lived a Christian of the name of Sergius who for many years held the high office of treasurer to the caliph. He had a son to whom he gave the best education that could then be given, his chief tutor being one Cosmas, an Italian monk, who had been taken prisoner by the Saracens, and sold as a slave at Baghdad. After the death of Sergius, his son succeeded him for some time as chief counselor, Pyro Omega Tau Omicron Sigma Mu Beta Omicron Upsilon Lambda Omicron, to the caliph Almanser. Such, however, had been the influence of the Italian monk on his pupil's mind, that he suddenly resolved to retire from the world, and to devote himself to study, meditation, and pious works. From the Monastery of Esti Saba, near Jerusalem, this former minister of the Caliph issued the most learned works on theology, particularly his Exposition of the Orthodox Faith. He soon became the highest authority on matters of dogma in the Eastern Church, and he still holds his place among the saints both of the Eastern and Western churches. His name was Jonas, and from being born at Damascus, the former capital of the Caliphs, he is best known in history as Jonas Damascenus, or Saint John of Damascus. He must have known Arabic, and probably Persian. But his mastery of Greek earned him, later in life, the name of Chrysoroas, or Gold Flowing. He became famous as the defender of the sacred images, and as the determined opponent of the Emperor Leo the Isaurian, about 726. It is difficult in his life to distinguish between legend and history, but that he had held high office at the court of the Caliph al Mansur, that he boldly opposed the iconoclastic policy of the Emperor Leo. And that he wrote the most learned theological works of his time, cannot be easily questioned. Among the works ascribed to him is a story called Barlam and Joseph. 40 There has been a fierce controversy as to whether he was the author of it or not. Though for our own immediate purposes it would be of little consequence whether the book was written by Jonas Damascenus or by some less distinguished ecclesiastic. I must confess that the arguments hitherto adduced against his authorship seem to me very weak. The Jesuits did not like the book, because it was a religious novel. They pointed to a passage in which the Holy Ghost is represented as proceeding from the Father, and the Son, as incompatible with the creed of an Eastern ecclesiastic. That very passage, however, has now been proved to be spurious. And it should be borne in mind, besides, that the controversy on the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father and the Son, or from the Father through the Son, dates a century later than Jonas. The fact, again, that the author does not mention Mohammedanism, 41 proves nothing against the authorship of Jonas, because, as he places Barlam and Joseph in the early centuries of Christianity, he would have ruined his story by any allusion to Muhammad's religion, then only a hundred years old. Besides, he had written a separate work, in which the relative merits of Christianity and Mohammedanism are discussed. 
the prominence given to the question of the worship of images shows that the story could not have been written much before the time of Jonas Damascenus. And there is nothing in the style of our author that could be pointed out as incompatible with the style of the great theologian. On the contrary, the author of Barlam and Joseph quotes the same authors whom Jonas Damascenus quotes most frequently, e.g., Basilius and Gregorius Nazianzus. And no one but Jonas could have taken long passages from his own works without saying where he borrowed them. 42. The story of Barlam and Joseph, or, as he is more commonly called, Josaphat, may be told in a few words, a king in India, an enemy and persecutor of the Christians, has an only son. The astrologers have predicted that he would embrace the new doctrine. His father, therefore, tries by all means in his power to keep him ignorant of the miseries of the world, and to create in him a taste for pleasure and enjoyment. A Christian hermit, however, gains access to the prince, and instructs him in the doctrines of the Christian religion. The young prince is not only baptized, but resolves to give up all his earthly riches. And after having converted his own father and many of his subjects, he follows his teacher into the desert. The real object of the book is to give a simple exposition of the principal doctrines of the Christian religion. It also contains a first attempt at comparative theology, for in the course of the story there is a disputation on the merits of the principal religions of the world, the Chaldean, the Egyptian, the Greek, the Jewish, and the Christian. But one of the chief attractions of this manual of Christian theology consisted in a number of fables and parables with which it is enlivened. Most of them have been traced to an Indian source. I shall mention one only which has found its way into almost every literature of the world. 43. A man was pursued by a unicorn, and while he tried to flee from it, he fell into a pit. In falling he stretched out both his arms, and laid hold of a small tree that was growing on one side of the pit. Having gained a firm footing, and holding to the tree, he fancied he was safe, when he saw two mice, a black and a white one, busy gnawing the root of the tree to which he was clinging. Looking down into the pit, he perceived a horrid dragon with his mouth wide open, ready to devour him, and when examining the place on which his feet rested, the heads of four serpents glared at him. Then he looked up, and observed drops of honey falling down from the tree to which he clung. Suddenly the unicorn, the dragon, the mice, and the serpents were all forgotten, and his mind was intent only on catching the drops of sweet honey trickling down from the tree. An explanation is hardly required. The unicorn is death, always chasing man, the pit is the world, the small tree is man's life, constantly gnawed by the black and the white mouse, i.e., by night and day, the four serpents are the four elements which compose the human body. The dragon below is meant for the jaws of hell. Surrounded by all these horrors, man is yet able to forget them all, and to think only of the pleasures of life, which, like a few drops of honey, fall into his mouth from the tree of life. 44. But what is still more curious is, that the author of Barlam and Josaphat has evidently taken his very hero, the Indian prince Josaphat, from an Indian source. In the Lalita Vistara, the life, though no doubt the legendary life, of Buddha, the father of Buddha is a king. When his son is born, the Brahman Asita predicts that he will rise to great glory, and become either a powerful king, or, renouncing the throne and embracing the life of a hermit become a Buddha. 45 The great object of his father is to prevent this. He therefore keeps the young prince, when he grows up, in his garden and palaces, surrounded by all pleasures which might turn his mind from contemplation to enjoyment. More especially he is to know nothing of illness, old age, and death, which might open his eyes to the misery and unreality of life. After a time, however, the prince receives permission to drive out. And then follow the four drives, forty-six so famous in Buddhist history. The places where these drives took place were commemorated by towers still standing in the time of F. A. Hyen's visit to India, early in the 5th century after Christ, and even in the time of Hyun Tsang, in the 7th century. I shall read you a short account of the three drives, 47. One day when the prince with a large retinue was driving through the eastern gate of the city, on the way to one of his parks, he met on the road an old man, broken and decrepit. 
one could see the veins and muscles over the whole of his body, his teeth chattered, he was covered with wrinkles, bald, and hardly able to utter hollow and unmelodious sounds. He was bent on his stick, and all his limbs and joints trembled. Who is that man, said the prince to his coachman. He is small and weak, his flesh and his blood are dried up, his muscles stick to his skin, his head is white, his teeth chatter, his body is wasted away. Leaning on his stick, he is hardly able to walk, stumbling at every step. Is there something peculiar in his family, or is this the common lot of all created beings? Sir, replied the coachman, that man is sinking under old age, his senses have become obtuse, suffering has destroyed his strength, and he is despised by his relations. He is without support and useless, and people have abandoned him, like a dead tree in a forest. But this is not peculiar to his family. In every creature youth is defeated by old age. Your father, your mother, all your relations, all your friends, will come to the same state, this is the appointed end of all creatures. Alas! replied the prince, are creatures so ignorant, so weak and foolish as to be proud of the youth by which they are intoxicated, not seeing the old age which awaits them? As for me, I go away. Coachman, turn my chariot quickly. What have I, the future prey of old age, what have I to do with pleasure? And the young prince returned to the city without going to the park. Another time the prince was driving through the southern gate to his pleasure garden, when he perceived on the road a man suffering from illness, parched with fever, his body wasted, covered with mud, without a friend, without a home. Hardly able to breathe, and frightened at the sight of himself, and the approach of death. Having questioned his coachman, and received from him the answer which he expected, the young prince said, Alas! Health is but the sport of a dream, and the fear of suffering must take this frightful form. Where is the wise man who, after having seen what he is, could any longer think of joy and pleasure? The prince turned his chariot, and returned to the city. A third time he was driving to his pleasure garden through the western gate, when he saw a dead body on the road, lying on a bier and covered with a cloth. The friends stood about crying, sobbing, tearing their hair, covering their heads with dust, striking their breasts, and uttering wild cries. The prince, again, calling his coachman to witness this painful scene, exclaimed, Oh, woe to youth, which must be destroyed by old age! Woe to health, which must be destroyed by so many diseases! Woe to this life, where a man remains so short a time! If there were no old age, no disease, no death, if these could he made captive forever! Then, betraying for the first time his intentions, the young prince said, Let us turn back, I must think how to accomplish deliverance. A last meeting put an end to hesitation. He was driving through the northern gate on the way to his pleasure gardens, when he saw a mendicant, who appeared outwardly calm, subdued, looking downwards, wearing with an air of dignity his religious vestment, and carrying an alms bowl. Who is that man? asked the prince. Sir, replied the coachman, this man is one of those who are called bhikshus, or mendicants. He has renounced all pleasures, all desires, and leads a life of austerity. He tries to conquer himself. He has become a devotee. Without passion, without envy, he walks about asking for alms. This is good and well said, replied the prince. The life of a devotee has always been praised by the wise. It will be my refuge, and the refuge of other creatures, it will lead us to a real life, to happiness and immortality. With these words the young prince turned his chariot, and returned to the city. If we now compare the story of Jonas of Damascus, we find that the early life of Josaphat is exactly the same as that of Buddha. His father is a king, and after the birth of his son, an astrologer predicts that he will rise to glory. Not, however, in his own kingdom, but in a higher and better one, in fact, that he will embrace the new and persecuted religion of the Christians. Everything is done to prevent this. He is kept in a beautiful palace, surrounded by all that is enjoyable, and great care is taken to keep him in ignorance of sickness, old age, and death. After a time, however, his father gives him leave to drive out. On one of his drives he sees two men, 
one maimed, the other blind. He asks what they are, and is told that they are suffering from disease. He then inquires whether all men are liable to disease, and whether it is known beforehand who will suffer from disease and who will be free, and when he hears the truth, he becomes sad, and returns home. Another time, when he drives out, he meets an old man with wrinkled face and shaking legs, bent down, with white hair, his teeth gone, and his voice faltering. He asks again what all this means, and is told that this is what happens to all men. And that no one can escape old age, and that in the end all men must die. Thereupon he returns home to meditate on death, till at last a hermit appears forty-eight and opens before his eyes a higher view of life, as contained in the Gospel of Christ. No one, I believe, can read these two stories without feeling convinced that one was borrowed from the other. And as F. A. Hyen, three hundred years before John of Damascus, saw the towers which commemorated the three drives of Buddha still standing among the ruins of the royal city of Kapilavastu. It follows that the Greek father borrowed his subject from the Buddhist scriptures. Were it necessary, it would be easy to point out still more minute coincidences between the life of Josaphat and of Buddha, the founder of the Buddhist religion. Both in the end convert their royal fathers, both fight manfully against the assaults of the flesh and the devil, both are regarded as saints before they die. Possibly even a proper name may have been transferred from the sacred canon of the Buddhists to the pages of the Greek writer. The driver who conducts Buddha then he flees by night from his palace where he leaves his wife, his only son, and all his treasures, in order to devote himself to a contemplative life, is called Chandaka, in Burmese, Sana. 49 The friend and companion of Barlam is called Zardin.50 Rianod in his Memoir Sir Elind, p. 91, 1849, was the first, it seems, to point out that Yudasf, mentioned by Masudi as the founder of the Sabian religion, and Yusaf, mentioned as the founder of Buddhism by the author of the Kitab al Firist, are both meant for Bodhisattva. A corruption quite intelligible with the system of transcribing that name with Persian letters. Professor Ben Fay has identified Theudas, the sorcerer in Barlam and Josaph, with the Devdatta of the Buddhist scriptures. 51. How palpable these coincidences are between the two stories is best shown by the fact that they were pointed out, independently of each other, by scholars in France, Germany, and England. I place France first, because in point of time M. Laboulaye was the first who called attention to it in one of his charming articles in the Debats, 52 A more detailed comparison was given by Dr. Liebrecht.53 and, lastly, Mr. Beale, in his translation of the Travels of F. A. Hyen, 54 called attention to the same fact, viz., that the story of Josaphat was borrowed from the Life of Buddha. I could mention the names of two or three scholars besides who happened to read the two books, and who could not help seeing, what was as clear as daylight. That Jonas Damascenus took the principal character of his religious novel from the Lalita Vistara, one of the sacred books of the Buddhists. But the merit of having been the first belongs to M. Laboulay. This fact is, no doubt, extremely curious in the history of literature. But there is another fact connected with it which is more than curious, and I wonder that it has never been pointed out before. It is well known that the story of Barlam and Josaphat became a most popular book during the Middle Ages. In the East it was translated into Syriac, Arabic, Ethiopic, Armenian, and Hebrew, in the West it exists in Latin, French, Italian, German, English, Spanish, Bohemian, and Polish. As early as 1204, a king of Norway translated it into Icelandic, and at a later time it was translated by a Jesuit missionary into Tegela, the classical language of the Philippine Islands. But this is not all, Barlam and Josaphat have actually risen to the rank of saints, both in the Eastern and in the Western churches. In the Eastern Church the 26th of August is the Saints' Day of Barlam and Josaphat. In the Roman Martyrologium, the 27th of November is assigned to them. There have been from time to time misgivings about the historical character of these two saints. Leo Alatius, in his Prolegomena, ventured to ask the question, whether the story of Barlam and Josaphat was more real than the Cyropedia of Xenophon or the Utopia of Thomas More. But, N. Bon Catholique, 
he replied, that as Barlam and Josaphat were mentioned, not only in the Mania of the Greek, but also in the Martyrologium of the Roman Church, he could not bring himself to believe that their history was imaginary. Bilius thought that to doubt the concluding words of the author, who says that he received the story of Barlam and Josaphat from men incapable of falsehood, would be to trust more in one's own suspicions than in Christian charity. Which believeth all things. Bellarminus thought he could prove the truth of the story by the fact that, at the end of it, the author himself invokes the two saints Barlam and Josaphat. Leo Alatius admitted, indeed, that some of the speeches and conversations occurring in the story might be the work of Jonas Damascenus, because Josaphat, having but recently been converted, could not have quoted so many passages from the Bible. But he implies that even this could be explained, because the Holy Ghost might have taught Saint Josaphat what to say. At all events, Leo has no mercy for those, Cabus omnia sub sanctorum nomini prodita male olent, quamadmitum de sanctus Giorgio, Christoforo, Hippolito, Caterina, alias gnusquam eos in rerum natura extatis impudentissime negantur. The Bishop of Avranche had likewise his doubts, but he calmed them by saying, Non pa que je vol susenir que tout en soit suppose, I l y oroit de la temerite a decevour chu i l y eight jame e u de barlam en i de Josaphat. Lo temo ignage du martyrologe, cales meto nombre de saints, e leur intercession que Saint Jean Damascene reclame a la fin de set histoire any permettent pa den doubter. 55. With us the question as to the historical or purely imaginary character of Josaphat has assumed a new and totally different aspect. We willingly accept the statement of Jonas Damascenus that the story of Barlam and Josaphat was told him by men who came from India. We know that in India a story was current of a prince who lived in the 6th century BC. A prince of whom it was predicted that he would resign the throne and devote his life to meditation in order to rise to the rank of a Buddha. The story tells us that his father did everything to prevent this. That he kept him in a palace secluded from the world, surrounded by all that makes life enjoyable, and that he tried to keep him in ignorance of sickness, old age, and death. We know from the same story that at last the young prince obtained permission to drive into the country, and that, by meeting an old man, a sick man, and a corpse, his eyes were opened to the unreality of life. And the vanity of this life's pleasures. That he escaped from his palace, and, after defeating the assaults of all adversaries, became the founder of a new religion. This is the story, it may be the legendary story, but at all events the recognized story of Gautama Sakyamuni, best known to us under the name of Buddha. If, then, Jonas Damascenus tells the same story, only putting the name of Joseph or Josaphat, i.e., Bodhisattva, in the place of Buddha, if all that is human and personal in the life of a sti. Josaphat is taken from the Lalita Vistara, what follows. It follows that, in the same sense in which La Fontaine's parrot is the Brahman of the Pankatantra, Saint Josaphat is the Buddha of the Buddhist canon. It follows that Buddha has become a saint in the Roman Church. It follows that, though under a different name, the sage of Kapilavastu, the founder of a religion which, whatever we may think of its dogma, is, in the purity of its morals, nearer to Christianity than any other religion, and which counts even now. After an existence of 2,400 years, 455 million of believers, has received the highest honors that the Christian Church can bestow. And whatever we may think of the sanctity of saints, let those who doubt the right of Buddha to a place among them read the story of his life as it is told in the Buddhist canon. If he lived the life which is there described, few saints have a better claim to the title than Buddha, and no one either in the Greek or in the Roman Church need be ashamed of having paid to Buddha's memory the honor that was intended for St. Josaphat, the Prince, the Hermit, and the Saint. History, here as elsewhere, is stranger than fiction, and a kind fairy, whom men call chance, has here, as elsewhere, remedied the ingratitude and injustice of the world. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Appendix 
I am enabled to add here a short account of an important discovery made by Professor Ben Fay with regard to the Syriac translation of our collection of fables. Doubts have been expressed by Silvestre de Sacy and others, as to the existence of this translation, which was mentioned for the first time in Ebba Jesus catalogue of Syriac writers published by Abraham Echelensis. And again later by Asimani, Biblioth. Orient, Tom. 3, Part 1, Page 219. M. Renat, on the contrary, had shown that the title of this translation, as transmitted to us, Kalalag and Damnag, was a guarantee of its historical authenticity. As a final K in Pahlavi becomes H in modern Persian, a title such as Kalalag and Damnag, answering to Kalalak and Damnak in Pahlavi, in Sanskrit Karataka and Damanaka, could only have been borrowed from the Persian before the Mohammedan era. Now that the interesting researches of Professor Ben Fay on this subject have been rewarded by the happy discovery of a Syriac translation, there remains but one point to be cleared up, viz. Whether this is really the translation made by Bud Periodux, and whether this same translation was made, as Ebajizu affirms, from the Indian text, or, as M. Rana supposes, from a Pahlavi version. I insert the account which Professor Ben Fay himself gave of his discovery in the supplement to the Algemeine Zeitung of July 12, 1871, and I may add that both text and translation are nearly ready for publication, 1875. The oldest MS. Of the Panskatantra. Gottingen, July 6, 1871. The account I am about to give will recall the novel of our celebrated compatriot Freitag, Die Verlorene Handschrift, or, The Lost MS. But with this essential difference, that we are not here treating of a creation of the imagination, but of a real fact, not of the MS of a work of which many other copies exist, but of an unique specimen, in short, of the MS. Of a work which, on the faith of one single mention, was believed to have been composed thirteen centuries ago. This mention, however, appeared to many critical scholars so untrustworthy, that they looked upon it as the mere result of confusion. Another most important difference is, that this search, which has lasted three years, has been followed by the happiest results, it has brought to light a MS. Which, even in this century, rich in important discoveries, deserves to be ranked as of the highest value. We have acquired in this MS. The oldest specimen preserved to our days of a work, which, as translated into various languages, has been more widely disseminated and has had a greater influence on the development of civilization than any other work, excepting the Bible. But to the point. Through the researches, which I have published in my edition of the Panskatantra, 56 it is known that about the 6th century of our era, a work existed in India, which treated of deep political questions under the form of fables. In which the actors were animals. It contained various chapters, but these subdivisions were not, as had been hitherto believed, 11 to 13 in number, but, as the MS just found shows most clearly, there were at least 12, perhaps 13 or 14. This work was afterwards so entirely altered in India, that five of these divisions were separated from the other six or nine, and much enlarged, whilst the remaining ones were entirely set aside. This apparently curtailed, but really enlarged edition of the old work, is the Sanskrit book so well known as the Panskatantra, the five books. It soon took the place, on its native soil, of the old work, causing the irreparable loss of the latter in India. But before this change of the old work had been effected in its own land, it had, in the first half of the 6th century, been carried to Persia, and translated into Pahlavi under King Chasra and Nusturban, 531-579. According to the researches which I have described in my book already quoted, the results of which are fully confirmed by the newly discovered MS. It cannot be doubted that, if this translation had been preserved, we should have in it a faithful reproduction of the original Indian work, from which, by various modifications, the Panskatantra is derived. But unfortunately this Pahlavi translation, like its Indian original, is irretrievably lost. But it is known to have been translated into Arabic in the 8th century by a native of Persia, by name Abdullah ibn al makafa d. 760, who had embraced Islamism, and it acquired, partly in this language, 
partly in translations and retranslations from it, apart from the recensions in India, which penetrated to East, North, and South Asia. That extensive circulation which has caused it to exercise the greatest influence on civilization in Western Asia, and throughout Europe. Besides this translation into Pahlavi, there was, according to one account, another, also of the 6th century, in Syriac. This account we owe to an Nestorian writer, who lived in the 13th century. He mentions in his catalogue of authors 57 a certain Bud Periodus, who probably about 570 had to inspect the Nestorian communities in Persia and India, and who says that, in addition to other books which he names. He translated the book Kalalag and Damnag from the Indian. Until three years ago, not the faintest trace of this old Syrian translation was to be found, and the celebrated Orientalist, Sylvester de Sacy, in the historical memoir which he prefixed to his edition of the Arabic translation. Kalila and Dimna, Paris, 1816, thought himself justified in seeing in this mention a mere confusion between Barzouye, the Pahlavi translator, and an Nestorian monk. The first trace of this Syriac version was found in May, 1868. Oh, the 6th of that month, Professor Bickel of Munster, the diligent promoter of Syrian philology, wrote to tell me that he had heard from a Syrian archdeacon from Urumia, Jokanan Bar Babish, who had visited Munster in the spring to collect alms, and had returned there again in May, that, some time previously, several Chaldean priests who had been visiting the Christians of Asti. Thomas in India, had brought back with them some copies of this Syriac translation, and had given them to the Catholic Patriarch in Elkosh, near Mosul. He had received one of these. Though the news appeared so unbelievable and the character of the Syrian priest little calculated to inspire confidence in his statements, it still seemed to me of sufficient importance for Rue to ask my friends to make further inquiries in India. Where other copies ought still to be in existence. Even were the result but a decided negative, it would be a gain to science. These inquiries had no effect in proving the truth of the archdeacon's assertions, but, at the same time, they did not disprove them. It would of course have been more natural to make inquiries among the Syrians. But from one of friends and from other causes, which I shall mention further on, I could hardly hope for any certain results, and least of all, that if the M.S. really existed, I could obtain it, or a copy of it. The track thus appeared to be lost, and not possible to be followed up, when, after the lapse of nearly two years, Professor Bickel, in a letter of February 22, 1870, drew my attention to the fact that the Chaldean patriarch, Joseph Otto, who, according to Jokanan Bar Babish, was in possession of that translation, was now in Rome, as member of the council summoned by the Pope. Through Dior. Scholl of Weimar, then in Rome, and one Italian savant, Signor Ignazio Ghidi, I was put into communication with the patriarch, and with another Chaldean priest, Bishop Kajat, and received communications, the latest of June 11, 1870. Which indeed proved the information of Jokanan Bar Babish to be entirely untrustworthy. But at the same time pointed to the probable existence of a MS of the Syriac translation at Martin. I did not wait for the last letters, which might have saved the discoverer much trouble, but might also have frustrated the whole inquiry. But, as soon as I had learnt the place where the MS might be, I wrote, May 6, 1870, exactly two years after the first trace of the MS had been brought to light, to my former pupil and friend, Dyar. Albert Sasson of Baal, who was then in Asia on a scientific expedition, begging him to make the most careful inquiries in Martin about this MS. And especially to satisfy himself whether it had been derived from the Arabian translation, or was independent of and older than the latter. We will let Dr. Sasson, the discoverer of the MS, tell us himself of his efforts and their results. I received your letter of May 6, 1870, a few days ago, by Baghdad and Mosul, at Yacho on the Shaboras. You say that you had heard that the book was in the library at Martin. I must own that I doubted seriously the truth of the information, for Oriental Christians always say that they possess every possible book, whilst in reality they have but few. I found this on my journey through the Christian mountain, the Tur el-Habedin, where I visited many places and monasteries but little known. 
I only saw Bibles in Estrangelo character, which were of value, nowhere profane books. But the people are so fanatical, and watch their books so closely, that it is very difficult to get sight of anything, and one has to keep them in good humor. Unless after a long sojourn, and with the aid of bribery, there can never be any thought of buying anything from a monastic library. Arrived in Marden, I set myself to discover the book. I naturally passed by all Moslem libraries, as Syriac books only exist among the Christians. I settled at first that the library in question could only be the Jacobite cloister, der Ez Zafran, the most important center of the Christians of Marden. I therefore sent to the Patriarch of Diyarbakir for most particular introductions. And started for, der Ez Zafran, which lies in the mountains, five and a half hours from Marden. The recommendations opened the library to me. I looked through four hundred volumes, without finding anything, there was not much of any value. On my return to Marden, I questioned people right and left, no one knew anything about it. At length I summoned up courage one day, and went to the Chaldean monastery. The different sects in Marden are most bitter against each other, and as I unfortunately lodged in the house of an American missionary, it was very difficult for me to gain access to these Catholics, who were unknown to me. Luckily my servant was a Catholic, and could state that I had no proselytizing schemes. After a time I asked about their books, missals and gospels were placed before me, I asked if they had any books of fables. Yes, there was one there. After a long search in the dust, it was found and brought to me. I opened it, and saw at the first glance, in red letters, Kalalag and Damnag, with the old termination G, which proved to me that the work was not translated from the Arabic, Kalila ve Dimna. You may be certain that I did not show what I felt. I soon laid the book quietly down. I had indeed before asked the monk specially for, Kalila and Dimna, and with some persistency, before I inquired generally for books of fables. But he had not the faintest suspicion that the book before him was the one so eagerly sought after. After about a week or ten days, in order to arouse no suspicion, I sent a trustworthy man to borrow the book. But he was asked at once if it were for the Frenji den Prat, Protestant, and my confidant was so good as to deny it, no, it was for himself. I then examined the book more carefully. Having it safely in my possession, I was not alarmed at the idea of a little hubbub. I therefore made inquiries, but in all secret, whether they would sell it. No, never, was the answer I expected and received, and the idea that I had borrowed it for myself was revived. I therefore began to have a copy made. But I was obliged to leave Martin and even the neighboring Diyarbakir, before I received the copy. In Martin itself the return of the book was loudly demanded, as soon as they knew I was having it copied. I was indeed delighted when, through the kindness of friends, post tot discrimina re rum I received the book at Aleppo. So far writes my friend, the fortunate discoverer, who, as early as the 19th of August, 1870, announced in a letter the happy recovery of the book. On April 20th, 1871, he kindly sent it to me from Ball. This is not the place to descant on the high importance of this discovery. It is only necessary to add that there is not the least doubt that it has put us in possession of the old Syriac translation, of which Ebegezer speaks. There is only one question still to be settled, whether it is derived direct from the Indian, or through the Pahlavi translation. In either case it is the oldest preserved rendering of the original, now lost in India, and therefore of priceless value. The fuller treatment of this and other questions, which spring from this discovery, will find a place in the edition of the text, with translation and commentary, which Professor Bickel is preparing in concert with Dr. Hoffman and myself. Theodore Benfey Notes Note A. I in modern times, too, each poet or fabulist tells the story as seems best to him. I give three recensions of the story of Parrot, copied from English schoolbooks. The Milkmaid A milkmaid who poised a full pail on her head. Thus mused on her prospects in life, it is said. Let me see, I should think that this milk will procure. One hundred good eggs or fourscore, to be sure. Well then, stop a bit, 
it must not be forgotten. Some of these may be broken, and some may be rotten. But if twenty for accident should be detached, it will leave me just sixty sound eggs to be hatched. Well, sixty sound eggs, no, sound chickens I mean. Of these some may die, we'll suppose seventeen. Seventeen, not so many, say ten at the most. Which will leave fifty chickens to boil or to roast. But then there's their barley, how much will they need? Why, they take but one grain at a time when they feed. So that's a mere trifle, now then, let me see. At a fair market price how much money there'll be? Six shillings a pair, five, four, three and six. To prevent all mistakes that low price I will fix. Now what will that make? Fifty chickens I said. Fifty times three and six, I'll ask brother Ned. Oh. But stop, three and sixpence a pair I must sell them. Well, a pair is a couple, now then let us tell them. A couple and fifty will go, my poor brain. Why just a score times, and five pairs will remain. Twenty-five pairs of fowls, now how tiresome it is. That I can't reckon up such money as this. Well there, s no use in trying, so let, s give a guess. I'll say twenty pounds, and it can be no less. Twenty pounds I am certain will buy me a cow. Thirty geese and two turkeys, eight pigs and a sow. Now if these turn out well, at the end of the year. I shall fill both my pockets with guineas, tis clear. Forgetting her burden when this she had said. The maid superciliously tossed up her head. When, alas for Lear prospects. Her milk pail descended. And so all her schemes for the future were ended. This moral, I think, may be safely attached. Reckon not on your chickens before they are hatched. Jeffreys Taylor Fable A country maid was walking with a pail of milk upon her head, when she fell into the following train of thoughts, the money for which I shall sell this milk will enable me to increase my stock of eggs to three hundred. These eggs will bring at least two hundred and fifty chickens. The chickens will be fit to carry to market about Christmas, when poultry always bear a good price, so that by May Day I shall have money enough to buy me a new gown. Green. Let me consider, yes, green becomes my complexion best, and green it shall be. In this dress I will go to the fair, where all the young fellows will strive to have me for a partner. But I shall perhaps refuse every one of them, and with an air of disdain toss from them. Charmed with this thought, she could not forbear acting with her head what thus passed in her mind, when down came the pail of milk, and with it all her fancied happiness. Dot, from Guy's British Spelling Book. Alnasker. Alnasker was a very idle fellow, that would never set his hand to work during his father's life. When his father died, he left him to the value of a hundred pounds in Persian money. In order to make the best of it, he laid it out in glasses and bottles, and the finest china. These he piled up in a large open basket at his feet, and leaned his back upon the wall of his shop in the hope that many people would come in to buy. As he sat in this posture, with his eyes upon the basket, he fell into an amusing train of thought, and talked thus to himself, This basket, says he, cost me a hundred pounds, which is all I had in the world. I shall quickly make two hundred of it by selling in retail. These two hundred shall in course of trade rise to ten thousand, when I will lay aside my trade of a glass man, and turn a dealer in pearls and diamonds, and all sorts of rich stones. When I have got as much wealth as I can desire, I will purchase the finest house I can find, with lands, slaves, and horses. Then I shall set myself on the footing of a prince, and will ask the Grand Vizier's daughter to be my wife. As soon as I have married her, I will buy her ten black servants, the youngest and best that can be got for money. When I have brought this princess to my house, I shall take care to breed her in due respect for me. To this end I shall confine her to her own rooms, make her a short visit, and talk but little to her. Her mother will then come and bring her daughter to me, as I am seated on a sofa. The daughter, with tears in her eyes, will fling herself at my feet, and beg me to take her into my favour. Then will I, to impress her with a proper respect for my person, draw up my leg, 
and spurn her from me with my foot in such a manner that she shall fall down several paces from the sofa. Al Nasker was entirely absorbed with his ideas, and could not forbear acting with his foot what he had in his thoughts. So that, striking his basket of brittle ware, which was the foundation of all his grand hopes, he kicked his glasses to a great distance into the street, and broke then into a thousand pieces. Spectator. From the Sixth Book, published by the Scottish School Book Association, W. Collins and Company, Edinburgh. Note B. Perch, in Benfi's Orient and Occident, Volume 2. Page 261. Here the story is told as follows Perchi si conta che un certo por homa hauia vicino a dui dormiua, un mulino and del buturo, and una nate tra esi bensando dis, io uendero questo mulino, and questo buturo tanto per il mino. Che io comprero dis capre. Lo quali mi figlierano in sinc messi altra tant, and in sinc anni multiplicarano fino a quattro cento. Lo quali beratero in cento bui, and con esi seminaro una capagna, and insiem de figlioli loro, and dal frutto della terra in altri cinc anni, saro alter modo rico, and ferro un palagio quadro, adorato, and comprero schioi una infinita. And prendero magli, lo quali mi fara un figliolo, and lo nominero pancolo, and lo ferro amistrare come by sona. Edsi vidro che non si curi con questa bacchetta cosi il percatero. Con che prendendo la bacchetta che gli era usina, and batendo di essa il vaso dui era il buturo, e lo rup, and fuse il buturo. Dopo gli partori la magli un figliolo, e la magli un di gli dis, habi un poco cura di questo fanciolo o marito, fino che io uo e torno de un sorujo. La quali essendo anata fu anco il marito chiamato dal signore della terra, and tratanto a wen che una serp sali sopra il fanciello. Etvna dunzella usina, corsa lia luxis. Tornado il marito wide insanguito el vesio, and bensando che costi el hoes exiso, anti che il udes, ludid sue capo, di un bastone, e el oxis. Entrato poi, and sano truando il figliolo, and la serp morta, si fu grandament pentito, and pious amerament. Cosi adunc i fretilosi in molt cos erano. Page 516. Note C. This and some other extracts, from books not to be found at Oxford, were kindly copied for me by my late friend, E. Deutsch, of the British Museum. Georgii Pecimerus Michael Paleologus, Siv Historia Serum A.M. P. Gesterum, Edition Peter Pausinus. Rome, 1666. Appendix ad Observations Pacamerianas, Specimen Sapientiae in Dorum Veterum Liber Olam ex Lingua Indica in Persicum a Persoi Medico, ex Persica in Arabicum a Bananimo, ex Arabica in Greekam a Simon Seth, a Petro Pacino Societ. Yesu, Novissime e Greca in Latinum Translatus. Huic Talia Sirios Naganti Hod Paolo Cordatia Mulier. Mihi viteris, spons, in quit, nostri cugistum famuli e gentissimi homina similis ista in ni provision nimis remoterum et inserto eventu pendentium rerum. Is diurnus mercedibus melis ac buteri non magna copia collecta duobus ista vasis e terra coctoli condiderate. Mach secum ita ratiocinans noct quadam dice bat, mel ego istat ac buterum quindesim minimum vendum denariis. Ex his decem caprizimum. He mihi quinto mens totidem alias periant. Quinqua annus grigium caparum facil quadrangentrum confessero. Has commutare tunc placet cum boba centum, cabus exorabo vim terrae magnum et numerum tritici maximum contrum. Ex fructibus his quinquennio multiplicatus, pecuniae silicet tantus existit modus, ut facil in locuplatissimus numer. Accedit dos uxoris quam istis opibus ditissimin nansisker. Nasiter mihi filius quem jam nunc discerno nominare panculum. Hunc ejacabo liberalisim, ut nobilium nulli concedat. Ca si ubi adoliverit, ut juventus solit, 
contumus em se mihi prebit, hod ferret impun. Baculo enim hoc ilium hoc modo ferium. Areptum inter hic descendum lecto vicinum baculum per tenebras jactabit, casuc incurrens in dolia melis et buteri juxta pasida, confregit utrunc, eta ut in aegis etium os barbonc stili licoris prosilerant. Quitera effusa et mixta pulveri prorsis corumperenter, ac fundamentum spe tanti, inapem et multum gementum memento destituerit. Page 602. Note D. Directorium Humani Vitae alias Parabili Antiquorum Sapientum, Folios S.1. E. K. 4, Circ. 1480. Desit olim quidum fut haremata apud quendum regem. Chue rex providrat qualibet die pro sua vita. Silicet provisionum de sua coquina et vasculum de mel. Alvero comitabat decocta. Et reservabat mel in quodam vase suspenso super sum caput donec es et plenum. Erat autumn mel precarum in illis dibus. Quadam vero di, dun jacerit in sua lecto elevato capite, respects it vas melis quat super caput ei pendibat. Et recordatus quonium mel de di in dm vendibator pluris salido seu carius, e dixit in cord suo. Quum furit hoc vas plenum. Vendum ipsum uno talento ori, de quo mihi imum decem oves, e successu temperis he oves facient filios e filas, et erunt viginti. Posts vero ipsis multiplicatus cum filius e filiabus in quatuor annus erunt quatuor centum. Tunc de quibuslabit quatuor ovibus imum vacum et bovum et turam. Et vaci multiplicabunter in filius, quorum masculos excipium mihi in culturum terra, Praetor id quat percipium de eis de lac de tilana. Donec non consummatus aliis quinqua annus multiplicabunter in tantum quat habibo mihi magna substantias et divitias, et ero acunctus reputatus dives et anestus. Et edificabo mihi tunc grandia et excellentia edificia pre omnibus mais vicinis et consaguinibus, attack omnes de mais divitius loquanter. Non erit mihi illa jocundum, eum omnes homilies mihi reverent I am in omnibus loci's exhibient. Accipium postia uxorum de nobilibus terra. Cum ke in cognavero, concipiat et periat mihi filium nobilum et delectabulum cum bona fortuna et de beneplacido ca crescit in scientia virtut. Et relinqua mihi per ipsum bonum memoriam post me obitum et castigabo ipsum ditim, si mi recalcitravert doctrine. AC mihi in omnibus erit obedians, edsi non, percutium eum isto baclo et erecto baculo ad percutiandum percusit vas melis e fregit ipsum et defluxit mel super capit aegis. Note e. Das buck der Weisheit der Alter Weisen, Ulm, 1415. Here the story is given as follows. Man sag ds wonet eins mals ein bruder der dritten regel der got fast dinet, Bay eins Kunigs Hof, den Versak der Kunig alet tag zu auf enthalt seins Lebens ein Kuchen Spice und ein Fleschlein mit Honig. Dicer as alet tag die Spice von der Kuchen und den Honig behielter in ein Erden Fleschlein das hing ob seiner Petstat so lang bis es Val Ward. Nun kam bald ein gross tour in den Honig und eins Morgens fru lag er in seinem pet und sach das Honig in dem Fleschlein ob seinem hot hangen du fiel ym in sein gedank die tour de Honigs und fing an mit im selb ze reden. One dis Fleschlein gants ball Honigs wert so ver kaufich das umb funf golden, derem kaufich mir zehen guter schaf und die machen alle de jars lember. Und dan worden eins jars zweinzig und die und das von yn kommen mag in zehen jaren worden tausend. Dan kaufich umb fear schaf ein ku und kauf dobi oxen und ertri die maren sich mit iron fructen und du nimich dan die frust zu arbeit der acker. Von den anden kun und schaffen nim ich millich und wall ee das andre funf jar furkeman so word es sich also marin das ich ein gross hab und reichtum uberkuman word dan will ich mir selbs connect und kellerin coffin und hohi und hubschball. Tun. 
UND Darnak so nimich mir ein hubesch wie von einem edeln Geschlecht die Beschlaf ich mit Kurzweiliger Leap. So entfekt sie UND Jebert mir ein schon glückseligten Sun UND Gottforchtigen. UND der Wirt Waxen in Leer UND Kunsten UND in Weisheit. Durch den Lass ich mir einen guten Lund nach Manien Tod. Aber word er nit falgig sein und minor straf nit acten so woltich yn mit manem stecken uber sein rucken on erbermd gar hart schlahen. Und nam sein stecken de mit man flag das pet ze macken ym selb ze ze gen we fretelik er sein son schlagen wolt. Und schlugi das erden fast das ob seinem hot hing zu stricken das ym das honig under sein antlet und in das pet trof und ward ym von allen sein gedenken nit dan das er sein antlet und pet western muesti. Note f. This translation has lately been published by Don Pascual de Gallangos in the Biblioteca de Autores Españoles, Madrid, 1860, volume 51. Here the story runs as follows, page 57. Del religioso que versio la mil et la mentica sobre su cabeza. Dijo la mujer, dicen que un religioso habia cada dia limosna de casa de un mercado rico, pan e mentica e mil e otras cosas, e comia el pan e lo al conde saba, e ponia la mil e la mentica en un jara, fasta quella fincho. Edi tenia la jera colgada e la cabesra de su cama. Edi vino tiempo que encaricio la mil e la mantica, e el religioso fablo un dia consigo mismo, estando asentado en su cama, e dijo así, vendir cuanto esta en esta jera por tantos maravedis, e compare con elos dias cabras, e de emprenarshan. E perren a cabo de cinco misis. E fizo cuenta de esta geisa, E fio que en cinco anos monterian bien cuatrocientas cabras. Desi dijo, venderlas he todas, e con el precio delas comprar cien vacas, por cada cuatro cabezas una vaca, e habira simiant e sembra con los buis, e de aprovcharm he de los beceros e de las fembras e de la leche e mantica. E de las mises habra grant haber, e labra mui nobles casas, e comprar siervos e siervas, e de esto fecho casarm he con una mujer mui rica, e formosa, e de grant logar, em profarla he de fijo veron, e nasira complido de sus miembros. E de criarlo he como a fijo de rey, e castigarlo he con esta vara, si non quisir ser bueno e obedient. E el deciendo esto, alzo la vara que tenia en la mano, e firio en la olla que estaba colgada encima del, e cabrola, e que o la mil e la mantica sobre su cabeza, etc. Note G. C. Poesis inadites du moyen age, parem edelstan du meril. Paris, 1854. 16. De viro et vais olii, page 239. Uxer abantiquo fut inficunda marido. Mysticium. L. Moesticium, Cujus Cupians Lenier Vix, 1. Vir, Hujus. His Blandamentis Solitar Tristi, T.I., Amentis. Cursic Tristaris. Dolor est tus omnis innis. Pulcri prolis eris satis amodo munera felix. Pro nihilo dusens conjunx haec verbula prudens. His verbis plain quat eight vir monstrat inane. Rebus in ops quidem. Bone vir, tihi dicam. Vas oleo plenum, longum quat retro per evum. Ledger at orando, loca per diversa vagando. Fun ligans ar, c, to, tecto, k, suspended abalto. Sic prestilator tempus quo pluris ornator, adder. Qua loca platari si sperit et arte beri. Talia dum captat, Hake stultus inania jactat. Eki potens factus, furo cum talia nactus. Vincere uxere quantum quio nobiliori. Tun sabulum gignam, esse meek per omnia dignum. Cujus opus morum genus omni prehibitivorum. Chue nisi tot vitae furent insignia right. Fustus hic absci mora furiat caput aegis et, h, ora. 
Quat dum nereret, dextrant minando leveret. Ut percussus et purum quasi presto fuisit. Vas in preedicta manus aegis dirigidictum. Servitum sibi vas il, l, ico fregit olivae. I owe the following extract to the kindness of M. Paul Meyer. Apology Fedrii ex ludicris I Regnerii Belnensis Doctor. Medici, Divion, Apud Petrum Palliat, 1643 in 12, 126 pages et de plus un index. Le recule se devise en du partis, pars I, pars 2. La fable en question est à la page 32, pars I, fab. 25. 25. Pagana et is mercis emter. Pagana mulier, lac in alia fictili. Ova in canistro, rusticae mersum penis. Ad civitatum proximam ibit venditum. In ius additu factus huit quidum obvious. Quanti ragavit ista quae fers vis emi. Et illa tanti. Tantin. Hoc furit nemis. Numera number me vis quat est equum. Vide. Hac mers quat sit nunc opus mihi plus debo. Quam priestet illum seed, e hos nemos cape. Ea quam supper be food rusticitas agit. Hominum reliquit uddis convicius. Quasi estimacit vilius mersum optimum. Aversa primos in vix tolerat grades. Cum lubricato corrut strato vii. Lac alia fundit quasa, gallinaceae. Testi vitellos conjurent cono suos. Capit crura mitted impingens petri. Lux ada nec furt coxa surgentum solo. Ride to regis non malum. Sed mens procax. Qua merx ed ipsa mercis et depreciam petit. Segue illa def lens tot patti infortunia. Nulli imputer quam sibi hanc sortum potest. Dolor sed omnis savita recrudgeut. Curationis danda cum mersus fut. In re minori cum caziti fragili tumit. Hunc sortis ingen sternit indignatio. Note H. Hulsbach, Silva Sermonum, Basilii, 1568, page 28, in Silva quadam mirabiter heramicola jam satis pervectii tatis, caquaque di exceed bat civitatum, afferens in mensurum melis, quad donabator. Hoc recondibat in vase terio, quat pependerat supra lectum sum. Uno di rum jasons in lecto, e habens baculum in manu sua, hecapud se dice bath, quadidi mihi dator vascula melis, quat dum indis recondo, fiat tandem summa aliqua. Jam vale mensura state rem unum. Careso autum eta florino uno aut altero, ima mihi oves, quae fenerbunt mihi plurus, cabus divenditis coima mihi elegantum uxorculum, cum quatransigam vitam meme latenter, xea suscitabo mihi puellum, quam instituum honeste. Si vero mihi nauret obadier, hoc baculo im eta cominuam, at lavato baculo confregit sum vasculum, etia fusum est mel, quare cassatum est sum propositum, eti menendum ad hoc in soa statu. Note I. El conde lucaner, compu esto por el excellentissimo principi don Juan Manuel, hijo del infante don Manuel, y nieto del santo rey don Fernando, Madrid, 1642, cap. 29, page 96. He tells the story as follows, there was a woman called Dona Trujana, Gertrude, rather poor than rich. One day she went to the market carrying a pot of honey on her head. On her way she began to think that she would sell the pot of honey, and buy a quantity of eggs, that from those eggs she would have chickens, that she would sell them and buy sheep. That the sheep would give her lambs, and thus calculating all her gains, she began to think herself much richer than her neighbors. With the riches which she imagined she possessed, she thought how she would marry her sons and daughters, and how she would walk in the street surrounded by her sons and daughters-in-law. And how people would consider her happy for having amassed so large a fortune, though she had been so poor. While she was thinking over all this, she began to laugh for joy, and struck her head and forehead with her hand. The pot of honey fell down, was broken, 
and she shed hot tears because she had lost all that she would have possessed if the pot of honey had not been broken. Note K. Bonaventure de Puriers, Les Contes OU Les Nouvelles. Amsterdam, 1735. Nouvelle 14. Volume 1, page 141. First edition, Lyon, 1558 Eat any less, less alchemists, scoroiden mieux compare chue un bon femme que portoit un poti de lake au marque. Faisant son compte ainsi, chuel la vendroit du liards, de ces du liards l en a kepteroit un design d'iofs, les quals l metroit couver, etn oroit un design de poussons, ces poussons deviendroient grands. Eat les ferro et chapiner. CES Chapons Madroyant Sink Souls La Peace, CE Seroit Un Escu E de Plus, Don't Ella Kepteroit Du Cochons, Massel E de Femel, Cadevi Androyant Grands Etian Feroyant Un Design Diotras, Chuel Vendroit Vinct Souls La Peace. Apre Les Avoir Nuris Quelk Temps, CE Seroyant Dos Franks, Don't Ella Kepteroit Un Iument, Caporteroit Un Beau Polain, Lequel Coastroit E de Devi Androit Tant Chanti, Il Sauteroit E de Ferro at him. Etienne disan hin, la bon femme, de l'ace chuel avoid en son compte, esse print a fer la ruad k ferro et son polain, etienne ce faisant esse poti de lake va tumor, etse respanded tout. Eti voila ses oafs, ses poussons, ses chapons, ses cochons, esse jument, e son polain, tu par terra. <laughs>